In Rwanda today, there are few obvious signs of the 1994 genocide that saw a million people, mainly Tutsis, hacked to death. They were killed by government forces backed by its Hutu militia, the Interahamwe. It ranks among the worst crimes of the 20th century, and the scars inside Rwanda are very deep, especially as many of the perpetrators have not been brought to justice. For Kwikwi, the memories of that genocide are still as fresh and as raw 13 years later. <laughs> The eldest of five children, Kwikwi made a split-second decision that saved her life. Her sister was not so lucky. Kwikwi survived by mingling with the killers and onlookers, but the price she paid for living was to witness her entire family shot dead. Her sister Yvette, whose arm had been severed when she was first shot, was the last to die. The man accused of leading the attacks on Kui Kui's family is Kalikt Mabura Shamana. During the genocide, he worked for the UN in Rwanda as a computer technician. I managed to track him down in Paris, where he now lives in exile. He has never faced trial for his alleged role in the genocide, for which he's always asserted his innocence. His case has outraged his co-workers at the UN. Basically, uh, Calix is, is alleged to have not only allowed uh, UN equipment to be used by the killers, by, by the Interhamwe, not only to have um, um, managed checkpoints, not only to have identified uh, staff, UN staff to be killed, but he is alleged to have actually been involved in the killing of UN staff either being present with, with uh, a militia or even having himself killed uh, UN staff. Charles Petrie was with the UN in Rwanda during the genocide. He's currently the United Nations most senior representative in Burma. He was a UN official, so he was entrusted with the responsibility of protecting UN staff as a UN member, he was bound to, to the principles that govern our conduct, which do not cover murder. And this is the last checkpoint of the government forces. Gromo Alex also worked for the UN in Rwanda. At the height of the genocide, he would have to drive on this road through the front line as opposing forces shot at each other. There were always people up here and then the RPA was on the other side of the valley. And so these guys, when we'd drive by, they would shoot and then the RPA would shoot back at them. 
When the UN fled, taking its international staff, its local staff were left behind to fend for themselves. But at great personal risk, two weeks into the genocide, Alex came back and stayed on. He knew many of the UN employees killed during the genocide. Their names are on this memorial outside the UNDP office. He remembers well one of his meetings with Kalix Mabura Shamana during the genocide. I'll never forget what he told me and how he told me it. He said, we will kill them all. Yeah, there are stories of lists and names being checked off. I think there are probably a large number of UN staff members, certainly, that uh, their whereabouts were facilitated by him. Alex is keen to speak out because of the number of his colleagues murdered and because Mabura Shamana has not faced trial. Why is it so important to get Kalix to Mabura Shamana? He did something. I know what he did. I knew what he was responsible for. I know people were terrorized by him. And as a human being, I'm obliged to follow through. I'm not doing this because um, of any particular individual. I'm not doing it because um, I hate Barushimano. On the other side of the world in New Zealand, policeman turned barrister Tony Gregg also feels compelled to speak out. I don't know Barushimano. Um, I don't like what he did. Uh, and it's not because I knew any of the victims. It's, um, it's, it's because he is someone who should have been indicted and he hasn't been simple as that. Greg spent a year working with the UN's International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, investigating whether Mabura Shamana had a case to answer. It was his investigation that resulted in this indictment being drawn up, accusing Mabura Shamana of genocide and directing or taking part in the killing of 32 people, including UN staff. Oh, there's very clear evidence. There's a large number, well, a large number. There's at least a dozen witnesses who have seen him personally at, at sites, either supervising killings or actually killing. He was put on the case after it was discovered that despite repeated warnings by UN staff and mounting evidence against Mabura Shamana, he was still working for the UN. I was surprised that they continued to employ him after twice being told uh, on a, or, sorry, at least twice being told um, what he'd been up to during the war. I've come to Rwanda to speak to people who knew Kalix Mabura Shamana and were either with him or saw him during the 100 days of the genocide. <laughs> Augustin, not his real name, now works as an electrician. He knew Mabura Shamana, they were neighbours. I show him a photo and ask him if he can identify those in it. No, I put a photo. Who are they? Those who witness crimes committed during the genocide are still at risk of being murdered if they dare speak out. But Augustin agrees to come with me to show me where he says he was a witness to murder. Augustin says Mabura Shimana was well known as a local leader and was in charge of a number of roadblocks near the house. Augustin says this is where he saw Kalix Mabura Shimana shoot dead a man known as Natari and his wife. They were ethnic Tutsis who their Hutu rivals, including Mabura Shamana, labelled cockroaches throughout the genocide. Can he remember what he was saying at the time? 
we have been acquiring yens. At the Gomba Kuba and Indians, but the Gomba Guturan. He tells me what he saw colleagues Mabur Shimana do at the Natari family house. Amura Sanga Mutugu, Umugura Murashimu and Anga Mutu. Umuya, we are Murashi, Chibamucho, who you have a good chunky temi. Augustine is just one of dozens of witnesses who have given evidence on oath to the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda about Mabura Shimana. This woman is another. She too worked with colleagues Mabura Shimana at the UNDP. She was hiding with more than 1,000 other terrified Tutsis at the Hotel Milkaleen, featured in the film Hotel Rwanda, when Mabura Shimana came looking for her. She is convinced he came to kill her. He asked for the keys. Did he ask you to leave with him? What, yeah, they what, asked me to, to come with them. And I told me I can't leave. Why? I can't leave Hotel de Mirkorin. To Why imagine to, to, to go with uh, those people who were specialists in killing people. While I was at Hotel de Mirkorin, I, di I didn't uh, dare to, to go with them. But there are others who have never been interviewed, and new evidence continues to emerge. This man used to work with the UN. He agreed to speak to Dateline, but he's asked not to be identified. He tells me about one of the most disturbing elements to this case. Once the international staff had fled, Mabura Shimana grabbed the keys to the UN. That gave him access to all the communications flowing through the UN office, including plans for any evacuations or safe havens for UN personnel. Then he, uh, he took the keys, all the keys of the office, and uh, he stayed, he, uh, he stayed like uh, re, uh, officer. Of, he was in charge. Yes, he stayed in charge of it. I know that he had certainly had access to the uh, res rep's office because they, he was using the sat phone, giving it, uh, giving access to the phone to various uh, government officials. And that's you can, that can be proved. Well, it was at the time. I mean, he, he signed, had the people sign for the utilization, and he signed beside them. But it is the murder of this woman, Florence Nagirimpatz, which shows just how deadly information about hiding places for UN personnel could become in the wrong hands. I mean, that was the plan, to go in with a armored personnel carrier and uh, extricate her and the others that were there. But I think what may have happened is someone learned about it and killed her before we could get there. It was her co-worker, who does not want to be identified, who drove here to discover her body and many of the 12 young girls she had been trying to protect. From there, I came here to, uh, to be sure that it's true and verify if really uh, she has been killed. Did Calixt ever talk to you about her after she died? Uh, when I lived here, I went to the office. So, a few minutes after Calixte came, I told him, I, I, I told him, you know, Florence has been killed with all the family who was with her. He said, oh, yes. That's all. That's all, nothing else. As UN investigators began gathering evidence, the world body belatedly took action. Mabura Shimana was arrested and stood down from his job with the UNDP, now in Kosovo. But when it came time for the UN's criminal tribunal to sign the indictment that had been drawn up, it faltered. The tribunal's chief prosecutor, Carla Del Ponte, decided there was not sufficient so-called special elements to proceed against him and refused to sign. I think it's crap. What, there was sufficient evidence. This is one of the few cases, it may even have been the strongest case against anybody that came through the tribunal of eyewitnesses of him killing 
and eyewitnesses of him ordering people to kill people. Australian barrister Ken Fleming QC was second in charge at the tribunal when the decision not to prosecute was made. The Rwandan tribunal was really there to prosecute the ringleaders, the big fish, and he didn't fall within that category. Um, to my mind, it wasn't because there wasn't a good case. There was a good case against him. Do you think in hindsight, though, that a special case should have been made against him, considering that he was a UN employee, that he was accused, that he is accused, of murdering UN, UN staff? Yeah, I think that there was sufficient to make an exception for him because, as you say, he was a UN employee and he was um, accused of murdering UN staff. I was also a policeman and I've, I've known large numbers of murders and very, very rarely has there ever been an eyewitness to any of those murders that I've known prosecuted, that I've been involved in investigating or, or, or anything else. Here we've got numbers of people who knew him and who saw him killing and supervising killings and saying what he was doing during those killings, he was wiping out Tutsis. It's as clear cut as that. It's, it is as clear cut as that. And even those on the tribunal agree that justice in this case has not been served. There was a case that he should have answered um, in a court properly constituted. There was sufficient evidence. There was sufficient evidence to make him answer the case. What's particularly galling to survivors in Rwanda is that Mabura Shimana's position at the UN enabled him to compromise their entire response to the genocide. Francois Nagarambe is the president of Abuka, which represents survivors of the genocide. Mabura Shimana allegedly used to, to, to try to get informed about any, uh, any, any communication to the UN Secretary General and uh, to, to, to grab those information and to transmit the information to the uh, army here and to the militia so that they know what the UN plan to do, especially if the UN plan to rescue the people or if the UN plan to intervene or if the UN plan to, to withdraw. It's an allegation the UN refuses to answer directly. Has any investigation ever been done into what information was spread through the office. As, as for these allegations, you're, you're right that there are outstanding allegations against Mr. Mbar Shumana, which is why we felt that he should be tried. In the absence of such a trial, I can't really comment but further these, these, on, this on is the about allegations the UN. because, because these, al these are allegations ultimately that have not been proven and I cannot uh, react to them as if they had been proven. For the past three years, Mabura Shimana has lived in Paris as a refugee. After weeks of searching for him with the help of private investigators... And this person, we found nothing, nothing. I managed to track him down through a Hutu rebel website. Mabura Shimana agrees to answer these allegations on camera for the first time. He comes with documents which he claims clear him of any wrongdoing. Uh, this is the ordonnance de non-lieu, uh -huh. which is the dismissal uh, order made by uh, the ICTR prosecutor. He's also brought a friend armed with a camera to film our meeting. I explained to you that I've been in Rwanda, that I've been talking to various people there. I have spoken to witnesses and to survivors. People are prepared to come out and say that you killed, that you were a killer, that people died at your hand and following your orders. What do you say about that? Whatever they have uh, said is not true. Do you remember the Natari family? Natali family? Yes. I don't know. I don't know that family. I spoke to someone who said that they saw you walk into that house and shoot dead the head of the family and then shoot his wife as she ran down the corridor. Listen, whatever they said is not true. I have not done anything wrong. I have never been involved in any kind of 
crimes in Rwanda. This was his response to the death of his colleague, Florence Nguiraparts, who was respected and admired by so many. She was killed. Do you remember hearing about that? Yes, I heard about it. What did you think when you heard that? A colleague, so many of your colleagues killed. Listen, I, ca I can't go into details of whatever has happened. Many people has died and it is very, very unfortunate that people have died. So, uh, what do you intend me to do? For now, Mabura Shamana is a free man. But in Rwanda, the government continues to gather evidence against him and wants him back to stand trial. Emmanuel Rukengera is the government's chief prosecutor for international cases. Ce que je peux dire, Comment dirais-je euh, promouvoir l'impunité et accepter que ces personnes soient jugées ou par leur pays, par le pays dans lequel ils se sont réfugiés, ou alors les extrader vers le, le pays dont le, qui est le Rwanda où ils ont commis ce crime de génocide. With the International Criminal Tribunal winding up operations, the Rwandan government is preparing to take over the caseload. But Rwanda's hopes of getting Kalik Zambura Shamana back to stand trial have struck a major hurdle. Diplomatic relations with France have been severed. It follows accusations by a leading anti-terrorist judge in Paris that Rwanda's president, Paul Kagame, was behind the spark that triggered the genocide. Mabura Shamana knows where he stands on the matter. The Rwandan government says the case against you is far from closed. They want you back. They want you back to stand trial. Would you go? No. Why should I go to Rwanda? There's no justice in Rwanda. So to go to Rwanda to face justice, just uh, like to, uh, to hang himself or to suicide himself. So that's not my case. When the Rwandan government tried to extradite him home from Kosovo in 2001, the International Criminal Tribunal for Kosovo denied the request on the grounds of insufficient evidence. After the decision not to bring Mabura Shamana before the courts, he took his own legal action. He sued the UN for not renewing his contract and its administrative tribunal awarded him a year's wages as the allegations against Mabura Shamana had never been tested in court. Uh, ultimately, no jurisdiction uh, uh, either tried him or, or was willing to extradite him, which is why ultimately last year we had, uh, with regret, uh, to comply with the decision by our own UN Administrative Tribunal uh, to, uh, to, to pay him back wages that he felt he was owed for when we terminated his contract in Kosovo. He'd broken every rule in the book, literally. Uh, he'd failed to obey the standards of an international civil servant. He'd, he'd failed to obey the standards of a human being. There was no way on earth that he justifies that payment. An organization that has been constructed and created to address, uh, among other things, the crime of genocide and to ensure that it doesn't happen again, that such an organization is not able to investigate the case, the alleged case against one of its own, against others of its own, I think is, is, is damning. What can the UN say to the survivors, to the families of those who were his victims or his alleged victims? The one thing we can say, and, and, I, and I say this sincerely as someone who's followed this for a number of years, is that we're, we are, we're very sorry. We did not want this to happen. We tried to do everything within our power to get to the bottom of this. And it is painful, you know, not, not just to a, to a handful of us, to, but to, to many people throughout the system. And as disappointed as we are, and, and believe me, we're disappointed. At the same time, we know enough about playing by the rules that we have resigned ourselves to the fact that, uh, that, this, that this case will not be tried. And we are sorry, and we are sorry to the victims for that.